Okay, I think uh, we are still waiting for some participants, but I think we can um, we can start now. Um, a warm welcome to the second of our lectures this year in commemoration of the 70th anniversaries of the 1951 convention. My name is Anja Klug. I'm the head of office for, of UNHCR for Switzerland and Liechtenstein. And I'm very pleased to see that this second lecture attracted also quite some attention in Switzerland and beyond. This lecture, with this lecture, we want to focus on the extraterritorial application of the non reformer principle. And with this, we want to explore the boundaries of states' responsibilities under international refugee law. I'm very pleased that this lecture is hosted by Professor Martina Caroni from the University of Luzern, who is herself an expert on this topic. And I'm extremely pleased that we could win Professor Hemme Batjes from the Amsterdam University to provide this lecture to us. Many, many thanks for making yourself available to us here in Switzerland and to all the, the audience we have from different countries from Europe. Uh, I would like to hand over to you, Martina, for an introduction to this lecture of Professor Batjes. And I wish us all a nice lecture. Thank you very much, Anja. And I share the great pleasure of welcoming you to today's event in the lecture series organized by UNHCR and Swiss universities in occasion of the 70th anniversary of the 1951 Refugee Convention. As was already mentioned, today's lecture is hosted by the University of Lucerne. I would have it would have been a great pleasure welcoming you all in the beautiful city of Lucerne, but for obvious reasons, this is not possible. But maybe, who knows, in five year times, it will be the 75th anniversary of the convention. So we will see what is happening then, maybe another series of lectures. The topic of today's lecture is the extraterritorial application of the principle of non refoulement a hotly contested issue of con contemporary migration law and migration management. While states support the Refugee Convention and view the principle of non refoulement as a cornerstone of international refugee protection, even consider it to have the character of use Kogans, their attitude is, let's be straightforward, rather schizophrenic. Because practical in the same breath in which they affirm the Refugee Convention and the principle of non refoulement, they implement deterrence and externalization policies aimed at ensuring that they do not have to assume the obligations arising from the principle of non refoulement. Thus, the extraterritorial application of the principle of non refoulement moves to the center of attention. I am very excited that we have succeeded in inviting a distinguished expert for today's guest lecture, Professor Hemme Batjes. Professor Batjes is Professor of European Asylum Law at the Free Universiteit Amsterdam. He wrote his PhD on the relation between European and international law. At his university, he co-founded the Migration Law Clinic, as well as the International Migration and Refugee a law master track. He further served as a member of the Dutch Minister's Advisory Committee on Alliance Affairs. His research, both in English and Dutch, focuses on the interplay between European, international and national migration law. Before I hand over the microphone and the screen to Professor Batjes, let me give you a quick information on how we are planning to structure today's guest lecture. First, now Professor Batjes will give his presentation. And um, of course, we will have a, a session with questions. Because we are a rather large group, I would ask you to print your question, type your questions in the chat. Um, we will, after the presentation of Professor Batjes, have a short five minute break to look through the questions to maybe group them a little bit and then we will um, have the question and answer session 
um, just after this short break. But now, Professor Batius, a warm welcome. Thank you for having accepted our invitation, and the floor is yours now. Thank you very much. Um, I must say I'm um, honored to be invited to uh, deliver this lecture, uh, to be invited by um, University of Lucerne, but both all by UNHCR. I mean, when UNHCR invites you, who can say no? Um, I must also admit that um, I am um, I may be an expert in asylum law, but I'm hopeless with computers, so I'm not able to share my screen, and therefore I've, I, I have to ask the host to um, to share my uh, slides um, with you. We'll we'll be going through quite some legal text, and therefore I thought it would be useful to put something on uh, paper. So, Margarita, may I? Thank you. Um, Okay, the, the, the issue of the extraterritorial application of the principle of, of uh, non refoulement. Um, as already mentioned in the introduction, it is a hotly debated um, uh, issue, and I think it's very important in, in present day um, asylum law. Next uh, slide, please. Um, for since about 1985, states have more and more externalized their migration control, and they have done so in two ways by offshoring it and outsourcing it. So they have offshored it in the sense that state um, uh, functionaries um, carry out migration control um, outside the territory. For example, um, by requesting um, uh, foreigners to apply for an entry visa within their country of, of, of origin. Furthermore, they have outsourced it. So, in order to preclude them from boarding planes, often um, liaison officers of member states will be present to advise uh, local authorities um, uh, on, on, on uh, who to enter, who not. And of course, they've also installed so called carrier sanctions on um, um, airplane firms um, in order to make sure that they will not um, um, bring in undocumented uh, migrants who might apply for asylum. And they've also outsourced it to other countries. For example, by way of the 2008 friendship treaty between um, Libya and Italy, included between uh, Berlusconi and um, uh, Gaddafi, that was intended to stem migration flows from um, uh, Libya to Italy, um, so to incite the Libyans to carry out so-called pullbacks. Now, all those practices are, of course, based on the premise that um, when a state offshores or outsources its migration control, it is not bound by its obligations under the Refugee Convention or under other uh, prohibitions of um, refoulement, for otherwise the practice would not make sense. Um, and as indeed uh, stated already, whether or not that is true, whether or not non refoulement applies abroad is a hotly debated issue for already over 30 years. And as one commentator has observed, Thomas Gamot of um, 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 Hansen, the reason for that is maybe because there is a tension at the heart of the issue. Next slide, please. So, on the one hand, you have the system of international law, which is still very much based on an understanding of state jurisdiction as territorial. So it's not only self-interest for states to argue that basically their human rights obligations are uh, confined to the territory. There's also some merit in it if you base that on public international law. So, or at least territorialist arguments can always be found for supporting that position. On the other hand, of course, you have the the um, uh, universalist approach towards human rights. Um, and between these two, the, the debate sort of oscillates between, between these two. Um, now, most commentators hold that in extremis, both positions are untenable. I mean, if human rights obligations apply only within the territory, then the consequence would be that outside states could do whatever they want, kill and, 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 and whatnot. On the other hand, a strict universalist approach would also seem to be untenable 
because um, there should be some, some jurisdictional link between the human rights holder on the one hand and the state on the other hand. For why would, for example, um, um, Iceland or South Korea be bound to address the drownings in the Mediterranean? Now, arguments from both sides can be found in, in uh, literature and in, in case law on the matter, which I will address in two, in two sections. I will first address the issue, the definition of jurisdiction, um, loki under the Refugee Convention, the Covenants, and the Convention Against Torture. And after that, I will separately discuss the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights on um, 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 so, so their, their uh, case law on um, jurisdiction. But before that, I will make a few remarks on um, the, um, the um, application of the, the non refoulement principle at borders and how states really find or, or play with these borders. Next section, please. So it's the 17th century of um, um, the Refugee Convention, and back in 51, when it was concluded, it was for it was quite uh, uncertain whether the non-refoulement principle applied at borders. In fact, most people assumed it didn't, and there was reason to think so because during the negotiation process, um, there was unwillingness to include a provision on admission to the territory and indeed some delegates amongst others those from the netherlands and um, from uh, switzerland um, um, put let it put on record that the um, prohibition of non-refoulement would not apply in case of mass influxes at the border and even the great advocates of of um, um, refugee rights Ra Matson wrote in 1963 still that rejection at the border was allowed for. Now, gradually, the position um, both in literature and in state practice has uh, changed. So in 1967, a, a resolution was um, adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations, which stated that rejection at the border were not allowed for. But then again, it made exception for mass influxes. I think in the following decades, there was general exception, uh, acceptance that the prohibition of refoulement always applies at borders. And that's the way it has been codified in, for example, the EU Asylum Procedures Directive. So the prohibition of refoulement applies on the territory, at the borders, in the territorial waters, with no exception. Also not in case of mass influxes. In the meantime, it seems that not all states are ready to um, accept that, or at least to always abide with that. So in recent years, I think we have seen also in uh, Europe more and more border closures, for example, during the um, um, so-called refugee crisis of 2015, 2016. Um, uh, but also in, uh, we, we can read daily about pushbacks by uh, Greece or by um, uh, Croatia. So this, this um, and, and all this um, happens without an, an outcry of indignation from, for example, the European Commission or other uh, states. So in law principle is, 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 is accepted as state practice um, is, is often um, um, defiant. Um, next, next slide, uh, please. Um, and we should further notice that the, the meaning of the term um, border seems to have changed since 1951. I mean, in those days when people thought about borders, it was this, this line dividing the territory of one state from the other states. And maybe for some of us, that's still the way we think about it. So as this, 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 this line um, that borders um, the Netherlands from Germany and, and uh, Belgium on the, on the map um, um, top right. But what we see is that in asylum law, the notion Border is used often in another sense, or has been given a sort of functional meaning, which is quite uh, different. So the Asylum Procedures Directive uh, speaks about border procedures and pre-entry detention 
at the border or in international zones. So the, the idea that comes to mind then is that there is some sort of no man's land between two states where a person is in a border procedure waiting to be admitted. Practice is different. So, for example, in the Netherlands, the, the external borders are in practice the harbor of Rotterdam and, of course, our airports, mostly Schiphol Airport new, near Amsterdam. So it's a little plane uh, just under uh, Amsterdam and uh, on, the, on the map. And our border detention center, where those border procedures take place, is near Schiphol, but outside the international zone. And when some person applies for asylum um, at Maastricht Airport, Eindhoven Airport, or in Rotterdam Harbor, he will or he or she will be transferred to that border retention center in the heart of the country. I mean, a place from where you can, can, can walk to the capital. So border seems to me mean here something um, um, like an, 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 I don't know, an, an administrative term that justifies um, um, basically detention, administrative detention for so-called uh, refusal of admittance, although, of course, people are already at the center of the country. Furthermore, the borders have been refined by various states. So, for example, the United States has for quite some time adopted the so-called dry food, wet food policy concerning um, Cuban migrants. So, this policy meant that Cuban migrants who were intercepted in territorial waters could be returned to uh, Cuba. That makes no sense from the standpoint of international law because territorial waters are just as much within your jurisdiction as your, as your uh, territory. But this was accepted by um, American courts and it led to some very strange uh, situations. So, for example, Cuban migrants who um, clung to uh, lighthouses a few hundred meters out of the coastline, and then the question came up, well, are they onshore, dry foods, then they would be admitted to the asylum procedure, or are they offshore, wet foods, and then they could be returned to uh, Cuba. Another example of this redefinition of borders and territories is the uh, Australian practice of excising territories. So, as from 2001, Australia has adopted this, this policy that the, those northern islands, so made yellow in the map um, uh, below, um, are excised from their migration zone. And that basically means that although the Geneva Convention is still set to apply there, people can not apply there for um, um, a, a asylum. Um, they cannot travel on to the mainland um, and they cannot appeal against that kind of decision um, uh, to courts. What they can do is they can be transferred to Nauru or uh, Papua New Guinea, and then there they uh, could go into a um, refugee state examination um, uh, procedure, and after that they could be resettled mostly outside Australia. So there seems to be this sort of internal border in Australia where meaningful protection of, of um, um, refugees is no longer um, uh, applied. Now, of course, Australia maintains that um, it does this with all good intentions, so precluding um, uh, both migrants from, from endeavoring dangerous um, trips and so on. Um, and they say that the convention still um, applies, but one can question whether that is actually true. I mean, um, a, a, a um, an application of the of the Geneva Convention without any recourse to courts seems quite meaningless to most um, observers. That is far away Australia, but I think something similar has happened in Europe in the last few years too. Uh, next uh, slide, please. And of course, the in the um, application of the so-called EU Turkey deal, which was concluded in 2016, uh, as you all know. The gist of this deal was that um, um, in return for um, new uh, vice policy and um, considerable funding from EU to Turkey, um, Turkey would uh, seal off its border to Greece. And if migrants still managed to 
reach the Greeks and Greek islands, they could be returned to Turkey. What happened was that on those Aegean islands, um, migrants um, well were received and they were not allowed to leave the region. So some sort of geographic restriction, as it's called, was introduced in, in Greek law. And then their applications uh, would be processed in a fast track border procedure where for Syrians, the safer country um, assumption would um, uh, always be applied in a sort of blanket way. Um, different from the Australian policy, it was possible to uh, appeal against those uh, decisions, but in fact, those decisions were almost always upheld by the uh, appeals committee. So what we had there in practice was also a sort of excise territory, the um, Aegean um, uh, islands, where um, apart from the poor reception conditions um, themselves, um, in, there was um, no meaningful way to apply for asylum in, um, in um, Europe. So what we see is that the border is not as clear a concept as it used to be in, or as it seemed in, 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 in 1951. It has more become a sort of gray zone or a sort of scatter over the country in uh, functional terms. And indeed, one could give many more instances. For example, the entry control for train passenger passengers to the United Kingdom is done at the other end of the channel, so in, in, um, in um, um, Calais. And that brings us to the historical scope of the application of um, non refoulement. Now, as I said, a lot has been debated on it, a lot has been written on it, but we have not very much um, jurisprudence. Um, uh, Below, I will address the uh, definitions of jurisdictions for the uh, Geneva Convention, the Covenant, and the Convention against um, Torture. And then after the break, I will address the rich but rather intricate uh, case law on this matter of the European Court of uh, Human Rights. Um, next uh, slide, please. Sorry, uh, next slide. Now, the extraterritorial scope of the prohibition of refoulement was in the 80s and 90s, first and foremost, debated. Um, um, as regards Article 33 of the uh, Geneva Convention. And different from some other human rights treaties, the Geneva Convention does not have a, um, a, um, a separate provision defining its uh, scope of application, defining its, uh, well, ju uh, jurisdiction where, where it applies. So we have to deduce the, um, the jurisdiction, the scope of application, rationologi, um, on the base of the text of the provision uh, read to object on purpose. And here, basically, two um, um, approaches, a, a ter territorialist one and a universalist one, have been advocated in the past. So, on the one hand, one could put the emphasis on the words expel or return, refoulé. And refoulé, as I think you all know, means something like um, um, rejecting at the border. So expulsion is from within the territory, and then return would mean non-rejection at the border. And the conclusion would then be that the provision does not allow for extraterritorial uh, application. In another reading, one should not read the term return so narrowly, and the term refoulé was just inserted to um, make sure that rejection at the border was also um, uh, included. But rather, one should put the emphasis on the not the where from issue, but the where to issue. So the words to the territories. So if the if the um, um, main aim of the of the provision is to prevent that people will end up um, in territories where they um, where they will face um, a persecution, then it makes sense to assume that re being returned to the territories could also be returned from 
outside the territory of Scotland, outside the territory of the, the um, um, state concerns. Now, UNHCR in the 1990s, and most commentators assume that the second reading is correct and that non refoulement applies also extraterritorially. As to case law, well, there's this one um, 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 well known case from the US Supreme Court where they apply a strictly territorial reading. Um, but um, um, most commentators see that as an isolated um, 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 instance, uh, which, is, which does not seem to be endorsed by um, other states. Okay, next, next um, slide, please. Where it comes to the covenant, the covenant does have a, um, a um, provision which um, defines its uh, scope of um, application. Article 2.1, and it says that each state, and, uh, each state undertakes to respect and ensure to all individuals within its territory and subject to its jurisdiction all rights in the covenants. Now, you can read that in two ways. So, you can read it as um, in, in a cumulative way. So, an individual has to be both within the territory and subject to the jurisdiction, but also in a disjunctive way. So, it applies to individuals within the territory and to individuals subject to the jurisdiction. And the Human Rights Committee has um, endorsed the second reading. So they stated in this general command that um, the covenant and hence also this implicit provision of refoulement under Article 7 applies to anyone within the power or effective control of a state, even if not situated within the territory of the state party. And this reading has been endorsed by the International Court of Justice in the case uh, war in occupied Palestinian territory, where it says that the covenant applies in respect of acts done by a state in the exercise of jurisdiction also outside its own territory. So there is clear wording and the International Court of Justice has repeated that also in respect to other conventions, other human rights conventions as well in um, other cases. What we can deduce from that is that um, de facto control is, is um, uh, sufficient, at least for the um, um, Human Rights Committee and the in, in International Court of um, Justice. The EU control is not uh, required. But how far, how far this, this jurisdiction goes um, is, to me, not clear yet. So, all the cases where the International Court of Justice address this extraterritorial application of human rights treaties concerns occupation of territory. So where a state has in fact full control over a territory of another state. And it is therefore not sure whether it would um, take the same approach where it comes to more incidental um, 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 acts of, of, of state um, outside its territory. So as, for example, the um, issue of a FISA or the um, actions of a uh, liaison um, officer. So this gives reason to assume that the prohibitions of reformat apply extraterritorially, um, but I'm sure to which cases exactly, to which type of case. Um, next slide, please. The um, Committee Against Torture has adopted basically the same approach as the uh, Human Rights Committee and the International Court of uh, Justice. So in this, in this convention, there is no general provision addressing the, um, um, the scope of application, but some provision state that they apply to any territory under state jurisdiction. And the CUT, the, the Committee Against Torture, has uh, stated in a general command that it's um, um, concerns also, um, well, situations territory outside the territory of the states, so embassies, detention centers, um, or other areas where the state exercises factual or effective control. So again, factual control, the jure control is 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 not um, required. And in this case, uh, case of um, J H A versus Spain, the um, committee ruled that. Um, 
any territory in which the state exercises directly or indirectly the euro or de facto effective control is within the jurisdiction of that state. And if that's true for, and also that it's, that it applies to the convention as a whole, so also to the um, prohibition of refoulement in Article 3 of the convention. So those are general statements. Then when we go to jurisprudence, next slide please, there is disappointingly little. Um, but what there is um, shows that at least on the high seas, um, the prohibition applies. So this, this case, JHA for Spain, concerns the um, concerns the, the acts of the Spanish um, Coast Guard, which uh, found outside the Canary Islands in international waters a, um, a uh, dinghy, they, and they towed them back to Mauritania. And the Committee Against Torture, referring to its general commands, um, stated that from the moment the Spanish Coast Guard uh, seized control over the vessel, from that moment, they were the, the migrants were within their jurisdiction for the purposes of the Convention Against um, Torture. And of course, the European Court of Human Rights has made a similar statement in um, the case of Hirsi Yama from 2011. So in that case, a, an Italian Navy um, vessel um, encountered three dinghies um, in the international waters in South um, Italy. They took the migrants on board, and from that moment on, they were within the jurisdiction of Italy, so the court um, uh, ruled. Where it comes to action in foreign territory, or at least in the territorial waters of um, uh, foreign states, this extraterritorial application of human rights treaties has been upheld by the Committee Against Torture as well. So in this case of JHA for Spain, the Spaniards um, um, towed the, the boat of migrants to Mauritania, and then together with Mauritanian officials, they sorted out who should um, get aboard um, in order to apply for um, um, asylum applications in Spain and who should stay in Mauritania. And during that process, they in fact detained the um, migrants on Mauritanian soil. And the Committee Against Torture held that during that period, they were in de facto control um, of, those, of those migrants and hence exercised jurisdiction over them. So although it was on Mauritanian, Mauritanian um, soil. Another case is the case of uh, Sunko, also from the um, Committee Against uh, Torture. Um, and this case concerns um, the actions of Spanish Ghost Guards who in uh, Moroccan territorial waters um, punctuated some um, inflatable boats with, uh, with um, migrants, um, took them on board and then set them off, um, well, close to the coastline. But one of those migrants could not swim and eventually uh, died um, uh, as a result. Here again, the committee found that by um, um, taking them on board, although within um, Moroccan ter ter territorial um, waters, um, the, uh, Spain, uh, they, Spain brought us migrants within their um, jurisdiction. So, so far we can conclude that non refoulement applies at least to deflection at sea by state authorities. And these are quite clear-cut cases, I think. I mean, in, in international waters, there is complete state control once a, a, a state um, uh, seizes a, um, a, um, a, um, a, a vessel. There's no concurring jurisdiction from other states. On foreign territory, um, the issue is, I think, more, more um, uh, intricate. For one thing, in these cases, um, Spain, or Italy in the case of Hirsi Yama, had complete fiscal control over the, uh, the uh, migrants. And again, when one could ask whether the same approach would be adopted if the control was less complete. So what in case um, of a refusal of FISA, would it be also um, jurisdiction for the purposes of the Convention Against Torture? 
Further, when acting on foreign territory, the, um, there may come about a, a, a conflict between this extraterritorial jurisdiction of, well, in these cases, uh, Spain and Italy, and the, and the jurisdiction of the territorial state. And um, here we should observe that in um, JHA for Spain, the committee also remarked that by virtue of a diplomatic agreement concluded with Mauritania, Spain exerted control. So that could be seen as an implication that when acting on foreign soil or in foreign territorial waters, um, there should also be a de jure basis for um, uh, assuming jurisdiction. Where this is true, of, where this is so, as I said, there is very little um, uh, jurisprudence um, uh, available. And finally, I must remark that in these instances, um, the consequences of state acts were relatively clear. I mean, in the case of um, Mirce Yama, the um, Italians brought those migrants to uh, Libya, where it was well known, there was plenty of information about the treatments of migrants in, in, in Libyan uh, detention centers. There was plenty of information on the Libyan practice of um, arbitrary repatriation. In case of, for example, the application for a visa or the refusal um, to board an airplane on the instigation of a liaison officer, then the consequences may be less clear. So when one applies for a visa and is refused, even if one assumes that this refusal is within the jurisdiction of, of states, what then exactly is the consequence of that refusal? Does it mean by necessity that a person ends up in a situation of persecution? I don't know. The state could argue, for example, that a person would be free to apply for a visa at another state, or if he's present in, a, in a, another state than the, than, the, than the country he fled, why not stay in that third country? So in such cases, I think the, the, um, the causal link between, on the one hand, the state act somehow um, 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 the, the, the state the state acts um, towards the migrants, and on the other hand, um, the the consequence of of um, uh, persecution is far less straightforward than it was in, for example, Hirsi Yama. So. On balance, I think that the, um, um, the Geneva Convention, as well as the Covenant and the Convention Against Torture, um, that jurisprudence of the Committee Against Torture and of the Court of Justice make clear that they can apply territorially, but still certain in what situations, apart from interception at the high seas, which uh, clearly um, um, is um, our instances of, of um, 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 jurisdiction extraterritorially. So far about the um, international um, uh, instruments. Um, after this, I would like to address the um, jurisprudence of the European Court of uh, Justice, but maybe we should have a break before. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for this first part of the presentation. We make a short break here. Um, you have also the, the possibility now during the short break to type the, your first questions already in the chat. And in five minutes time, we're back with part two of the presentation. Have a good break, thanks. Should I share your slides again, Professor Batjes? Yes, please. 
Yes, next, next uh, slide, please. So then the meaning of jurisdiction and extraterritorial jurisdiction under the European Convention of um, uh, Human Rights. And here I will basically discuss uh, four cases, uh, Bankovic, um, Alskaini, Hirsi Yama, and um, MN. Um, before Bankovic, a case from 2001, um, the issue of jurisdiction was not a big issue. Um, so on Article 1 of the Convention, the provision that states, states shall secure to everyone within that jurisdiction um, convention rights, the, the court was um, happy when some form of authority or control could be, could be shown. So the provision did not really function as a sort of obstacle for assuming extraterritorial jurisdiction, but it became an obstacle as from Bankovic. Now the case, concerns the, the bombing of a um, television and radio station in Biograd in the, in the context of the, of the Kosovo War. And during this bombing, a um, few people died and family members, they um, complained that Belgium and other European um, NATO members um, had violated Article 2 of the Convention, the rights to life. And their argumentation was quite straightforward. By bombing those family members, they had, well, brought those family members within their jurisdiction. So a universalist um, approach, which maybe would be accepted by the International Court of um, uh, Justice. However, the Court of Human Rights took another um, um, approach and they gave a quite restrictive reading of the notion of jurisdiction. So they started out with observing that jurisdiction is essentially territorial. It is possible to have case of extraterritorial uh, jurisdiction, but such bases require special justification. Above that, they also reason that the extraterritorial exercise of jurisdiction is defined and limited by the sovereign territorial rights of the other states. So, again, a restrictive um, uh, reading. And according to many commentators, what the court here did was basically making a, a mistake. So, what the court here did was basically um, taking the, the the concept of prescriptive jurisdiction, so for the Netherlands, the Dutch lawmaker make laws, as the basis for jurisdiction in, in Article 1. As to the extraterritorial exercise of jurisdiction, the court saw so sort of summarizing also its own, uh, own uh, previous uh, case on it, saw so, um, two types. Um, first, what has been called the spatial model. So, a state exercise jurisdiction when it has the effective overall control over a territory and exercise all or some of the public powers of the territorial state. So, of the state where that territory is 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 um, is um, part of. So, here it introduced the. A bit nebulous notion of of um, public powers. So states should apparently um, um, act in view of the of the um, territorial um, state. As to the second type of um, extraterritorial exercise of of um, jurisdiction, um, the court says that. Other instances were um, activities of its diplomatic or consular agents abroad on board of crafts and uh, vessels registered in or flying the flag of, of a state and that it was based on custom or treaty law. Um, so here again, it's, it's, it seems to emphasize a sort of legal basis for extraterritorial exercise of jurisdiction. By doing so, it's explicitly rejected the, the 
ID of the um, um, appellants that a state could exercise extraterritorial jurisdiction just for the purposes of one issue. So in that case, the, the right to life. So the court stated that Article 1 does not provide any support. The jurisdiction can be divided and tailored in accordance with the particular circumstances of the extraterritorial act in question. There could be no cause and effect reasoning, as the court stated. So jurisdiction seemed to be a sort of all or nothing um, uh, thing. So the conclusion seemed to be that there should be some legal title for extraterritorial exercise of uh, um, jurisdiction and that such jurisdiction should be sort of complete or nothing. Now, there was a lot of criticism on this, on this uh, case, case and the courts sort of step back a little in the case of um, Alskaini. Next um, uh, slide, please. And this case concerns um, British troops in Iraq in, um, I think, uh, 2003, 2004, who um, um, killed a number of Iraqis um, and, um, well, ill treated um, a 6 1 um, in um, detention. Here, of course, the UK argued that. As it was extraterritorial, as there was no complete control over the area, over Basra, um, it was no exercise of jurisdiction. And what the court did in Alskaini was repeating that the normal meaning of jurisdiction is territorial and that extraterritorial exercise requires special justification. And it's repeated and somewhat refined the two models uh, which it already presented in, um, in uh, Bankovic. So one is overall control of territory and second state agent authority and control over persons. And it addressed the killings by the British soldiers under this second heading. So the court reasons that um, as the United Kingdom um, um, had assumed responsibility to maintain um, order and security in the Basra um, region. They had taken over some public powers from the Iraqi state and in so far exercised um, um, jurisdiction. Furthermore, it stated that no longer this all or nothing approach applied. Um, so, when a state exercises control, it ruled, it must secure rights that are relevant to the situation of that individual. And in so far, then, um, it can be um, um, tailored and uh, divided. So, in that sense, it's retreated from the um, ruling in, um, in um, uh, Bankovic. And in general, the approach seemed far more factual than in Bankovic, so far less emphasis on this on this legal title, but it still referred to this exercise of public powers. So the consequence was still that a killing abroad in itself was not yet enough to bring the case within the jurisdiction of the state that killed exercise of public powers was required. So it was jurisdiction because the British had taken it upon themselves to secure um, law and order in, in Basra, but some incidental, I don't know, uh, drone killing in, in, in Yemen would apparently still fall outside um, um, the notion of jurisdiction as defined by the European Court of um, Human Rights. Now, as we move from that to the um, 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 the case of, of, of migration control, then here's your man from the same year is interesting in, in the first place. Um, as I said already, the 
the court ruled there that from the moment they took uh, the Italian Navy took on board um, um, migrants, they assumed um, that they, they, they assumed control, um, and the um, the migrants were within the jurisdiction of the Italian states. So they concluded that they were in continuous and exclusive de jure and de facto control. What is unclear here is whether both forms of control are required. So indeed, of course, an Italian naval vessel, um, it, uh, Italy has de jure control uh, on that. So if that's enough, why then de facto control required? Or if de facto control is enough, why then mentioning that there's also de jure control. So in that sense, it's, it seems still a bit stuck in the Bankvich line of uh, thinking. So what is not clear from the case is whether de facto control means complete fiscal control as a state has when it has the migrants on board of this, of this uh, Navy vessel. Now, other cases suggested that, that it's not required. So there was this case of uh, Sahavara, 2001, have been other cases where um, um, states directed the course of, of um, ships without mounting those ships. And that seemed already, and that appeared already enough um, to exercise extraterritorial judicial, uh, extraterritorial um, control, uh, extraterritorial um, uh, jurisdiction. So fiscal control seems not to be needed at least not um, at the high seas. Then uh, the case of um, MN. Next slide, please. Um, MN versus Belgium concerned the application for a humanitarian visa with the, with the Belgian embassy in Beirut. So under Article 25 of the visa code, one can apply for a humanitarian visa. The application was re uh, rejected, the idea being that the vice is for 90 days, and if you want asylum, then you'll stay for more than, than um, uh, 90 days. Um, so the case was brought before the European Court of um, uh, Human Rights, and um, many people had high hopes uh, for the case, for if the court would assume jurisdiction here, then it would open up this possibility of a, a safe pathway to Europe for um, Syrian um, refugees in uh, Lebanon, but the court did not accept um, um, Belgian jurisdiction here, and it addressed the matter under two headings. First, whether Belgium exercised territorial jurisdiction, the idea being that the vice application was processed in practice on Belgian soil by, by functionaries in, I don't know, in, uh, in, um, in Brussels. Now, the court stated that indeed that was the exercise of public power, um, namely a refusal and hence uh, on, on the condition of, uh, of, um, of entry, but exercise of public power, territorial exercise of public power was not enough. Um, that, nor the fact that decisions had an impact on the situation of persons, residents abroad. That, so no more explanation. So here the conclusion seems to be that there can be no territorial jurisdiction um, over people who are still outside the territory. There has to be. I think some some sort of um, fiscal control apparently. Then the question whether there was extraterritorial exercise of jurisdiction, or in the bank fee trace, were there exceptional circumstances justifying extraterritorial jurisdictions? And here the court reasoned that the acts of consular agents amounts to jurisdiction, as they had already done in Bankovich and repeated in many cases, but only if it concerns authority in respect of the state nationals or their property. And otherwise, only if they have physical power and control over certain persons, that is foreigners. So the extraterritorial 
exercise by of, of jurisdiction by consular authorities on a legal basis, on a treaty and customary basis uh, identified in Benkovic, after all, concerns only nationals and their property. And not without more foreigners, for then fiscal power and control would be required. Now, those requirements were not fulfilled in the cases of uh, in the case of, of, of MN. So the applicants had no previous link with Belgium. They were not Belgian nationals, and there was no de facto, apparently no fiscal power and control over them um, for their being in the in the embassy, for they had freely entered it and, and left it. And therefore, they fell outside the jurisdiction of uh, Belgium. Finally, they remarked that also the fact that the applicants had brought domestic proceedings against Belgium in Belgium that does not create such a jurisdictional link. And it had to add it because in cases of um, 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 criminal proceedings, the fact that a state brings criminal proceedings um, against a person uh, not on its territory is enough for assuming extraterritorial exercise of jurisdiction, the court has ruled. But in this case, they had started proceedings themselves, and therefore it was not enough. So this was a, well, quite disappointing case, I think. And what is worse, it has not so good implications, I think, for um, other cases on extraterritorial jurisdiction. For one thing, the court put very much stress on the exceptional nature of the extraterritorial exercise of jurisdiction. And for the first time since Bankovic, it repeated this statement that the extraterritorial exercise jurisdiction is, as a general rule, defined and limited by the sovereign territory, uh, territorial rights of the other relevant states. The idea being that, in principle, MN was under um, uh, Lebanon jurisdiction, and therefore not under Belgian um, jurisdiction. So this, this stress on um, a, a narrow conception of extraterritorial exercise of, so much stress on the um, no, narrow construction of extraterritorial uh, exercise of, 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 of jurisdiction. Furthermore, it turned out that the exercise to the power in itself is not enough. Besides that, some form of control, in fact, it seems fiscal control, seem to be um, required. And that also applies to extraterritorial jurisdictions by consular authority over uh, foreigners. And here the court obviously could have ruled otherwise. So, for example, we have this, well, quite old, but still um, ruling of the European Commission of Human Rights, WM versus Denmark, where the commission accepted that being on the, um, um, uh, be being in the embassy is in itself enough to bring one within the extraterritorial jurisdiction of uh, another state. And the um, Inter-American Court of Human Rights has um, issued a, uh, an advisory opinion um, on the request of uh, Ecuador for the uh, 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 Julian uh, Assange case, where it stated that when a person enters an embassy and asks for asylum there, that triggers the prohibition of refoulement. It's so one is by definition then within the jurisdiction, the territorial jurisdiction of the, of the state, and that state has all kinds of obligations under the prohibition of refoulement. So it must um, uh, make efforts to find um, a safe passage uh, for this for this um, asylum seeker to a safe um, uh, country. And in also case on um, 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 
humanitarian, humanitarian visa applications, the case of um, X and X before the Court of uh, Justice, Advocate General Mengozi had stated quite simply that a member state exercises jurisdiction when it ex executes um, European Union law, so also when it applies um, the, the, the FISA codes, regardless of territorial considerations. But alas, all that was not followed by the European Court of uh, Human Rights. So MN is, I think, a disappointment where it comes to um, the um, where it comes to assuming um, extraterritorial jurisdiction um, for the um, as regards the um, applications for for FISA, but also bodes ill for other cases on um, extraterritorial jurisdiction if they are to be brought um, before the court. As, for example, uh, well, the activities of the um, um, liaison officers at, at, at foreign airports. But maybe the matter is different where it comes to conflictless control. So, the situation where a state does not um, exert or does not um, um, carry out the control itself, but does it well by, by pro proxy through another state. And as example, I will then discuss the um, cooperation between um, Libya or between Italy and um, Libya, because it's important, but also because a very interesting case is now pending before the European Court of um, Human Rights. Uh, but before addressing the facts of the case, I will first um, give some um, backgrounds. Um, after Hirsiyama, um, Italy stepped up its, 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 its efforts as regards uh, search and uh, rescue. So it's, um, um, it's um, yes, so it's, um, it's, 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 it's initiated uh, search and rescue um, um, uh, campaigns and uh, not also within its own SAR area, but also south of that. For all coastal states have a search and rescue um, area where they should um, coordinate um, the, um, well, search and, 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 and rescue um, uh, operations for ships in, uh, in um, distress. So they performed search and, 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 and rescue um, expeditions all the way to the Libyan territorial um, waters. And they would bring the migrants they found to Italy. Now, they wanted to put an end to that, apparently, for in 2017, they signed a memorandum of understanding with Libyan authorities. And this memorandum of understanding was based on that um, friendship treaty between Libya and Italy from 2008. It had fallen in disuse, of course, during the um, well, when during the civil war in, in, in Libya, but apparently in um, 2015, Italy thought the time was arrived to um, 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 revive it. So there was this memorandum where they, where the both countries agreed um, to step up cooperation to stem migration uh, flows. And for that, uh, Libya would be funded by both Italy and the, UA, and, and the EU. So, Italy has donated ships to the Libyan Coast Guard. They have um, 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 secured training of Libyan Coast Guard um, uh, members, and they have furnished all kinds of technical equipment. And on the request of both the EU and of Italy, um, Libya again um, established its own search and rescue um, area uh, north of its territorial um, waters. So on paper, in that area, Libya now performs its own search and rescue operation. However, in practice, Libya is hardly capable of doing so. For in order to coordinate such, coordin uh, such um, uh, operation, you, you need a, a um, well, technical equipment of a um, what's called maritime rescue coordination um, uh, center, 
which they don't have, and probably also not sufficient uh, staff to, to man it. So in practice, those, those operations are by and large coordinated by um, Italy. So signals from ships in distress come in at the Maritime Rescue Coordination Center in Rome, and then um, information will be passed um, to um, the Libyan authorities but through an Italian naval vessel that is, for that reason, docked in uh, Tripoli. So what we have here is um, search and rescue um, um, operations, which may be carried out also by the um, Libyan um, Coast Guard, but we are on behalf of Libya. In fact, most of the coordination is done by um, Italy. So that brings then, of course, the question whether um, um, Italy is also responsible for the way Libya executes its, its operation. And from general information, we know that um, the, um, the way the Libyan Coast Guard um, um, operates, um, well, that's not how, it's, uh, how it uh, should be. And from one of those instances, um, we know the facts very well because they have been um, communicated um, to the court case of SS First Italy. Um, and it concerns an incident on 6 November 2017. So what, what happened was that there was this, this um, a, um, a, um, a small ship, a um, dinghy, um, with about 150 meters um, that started to, to capsize north of Libya in international um, waters. And it sent out a, a rescue uh, signal. It was received in, in Rome, in this maritime um, um, rescue coordination uh, center. Um, and this center uh, sent it to all vessels nearby requiring assistance, as it uh, should do under international law. And that signal was received by two vessels, one being an NGO vessel, the Sea Watch, and another one being a Libyan Coast Guard vessel, the Ras Al Jadar, a vessel which was, by the way, donated by Italy to Libya. To, 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 to Libya. Now it seems that this this Sea Watch was um, first on scene and started um, rescue um, um, uh, obligations, but then the um, Libyan um, Coast Guard vessel, the Ras Al Jadar. Um, arrived causing a huge wave which um, um, well caused many people to fall out of the dinghy and 20 of them um, drowned and then the Libyan Coast Guard's personnel started to obstruct the rescue offers by the Sea Watch so Libyan Coast Guard started throwing things um, at, at, at migrants and hitting them with um, um, ropes and they did not um, um, send them uh, or throw down um, saving uh, jackets. Now eventually the Sea Watch was able to save 59 people and brought them to Italy and 37 of those migrants were able to climb aboard the Ras Al Jadar where they were tied up, brought to Libya where several of them were uh, detained in quite brutal conditions and uh, beaten, and some of them were then sent to Libya. And a number of the survivors has, have brought complaints before the European Court, um, namely exposure to ill treatment, um, ill treatments, the death of two children, because this, this, this is a big wave caused by the Ras Al Jadar. Um, Refoulement to Libya and chain Refoulement to uh, Nigeria. Now, of, in of itself, um, it is not so odd to assume, um, um, oh no, let me put it another way. Um, the question here, it is, it is clear that the, the, the actual ill treatment was brought about by Libyan officials. So in that sense, certainly outside um, um, Italian um, um, jurisdiction, but as said before, the Italians 
in fact did most of the coordination of this of this rescue um, um, uh, efforts. Um, they were involved also in this case uh, through this um, uh, team um, rescue coordination center. Um, besides that, an Italian helicopter was close by the scene um, the whole of the of the time. And the question come, therefore comes up whether indeed Italy can be held responsible for the acts of Libyan coast guards in this case. Would otherwise, did they have sufficient control over the acts of the coast guards? Now, one way of addressing this issue is through the um, 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 articles of state responsibility for wrongful acts. Um, next slide, please. Yes. So um, the International Law Commission articles on state responsibility for wrongful acts is, of course, not a treaty, um, but um, they have been adopted by the um, uh, General Assembly. And besides, the International Court of Justice has said that the article in question, Article 16, is uh, custom. So it is it is uh, binding. And this provision says that a state that aids or assists another state in the commission of an international an internationally wrongful act by the latter state, by, by, by uh, Libya in this case, is internationally responsible for doing so if two conditions are met. First, it has knowledge of the circumstance of the international wrongful act. And second, the act would be internationally wrongful if it were committed by that state, so by um, um, Italy. Um, now, there's very little jurisprudence on this on this uh, provision. So what we know about is mostly, or what's sure about is mostly from the commentary um, of the International Law Commission. Um, and from that, we know that the notion of aid or assistance is very broad. It can take, it can take uh, many forms. So um, financing or providing material support have been mentioned as um, um, examples. Furthermore, um, the Court of Justice, uh, the, yes, the International Court of Justice has uh, ruled that it is not required that this aid is essential for committing the wrongful act. It is sufficient um, if it is a significant contribution, if it's a significant contribution. Furthermore, I think that requirement B is, is also met. So the acts by the Libyan Coast Guards are prohibited by Article 7 of the Covenant to which both Italy and um, Libya are a party. The difficult part here is the knowledge of the circumstance of the internationally wrongful act. Um, according to some commentators, what is required is intent or something coming very, very close to that. If that is true, then I think it will be difficult to apply the provision to this to this case, because the intent of Italy was not in itself the wrongful acts committed by Libyan Coast Guards. I mean, they they want to stem refugee flows, not ill treatment of, of um, uh, migrants. But then if knowledge means more like something like awareness, then it's, it could be met. I mean, the way Libya treats migrants, both during rescue operations, but also um, on Libyan soil is uh, well known already since, um, since um, uh, Hiroshima. So there may be possibility um, here. What is more, there are a number of cases where the European Court of Human Rights did um, accept state responsibility for acts committed by other states. And the first to mention here is the case of al Nashiri. Um, and this is a, um, a post, um, well, 9-11 case, 
So it concerns the, uh, well, the, um, the renditions um, that were then uh, common by the CIA of um, terrorism suspects. And the CIA run a secret prison in Poland where they ill-treated and tortured their suspects and then um, would um, uh, transport them over to Afghanistan or that kind of place to, um, well, to um, continue their uh, business. Now, in the case of al Nashiri, Poland was found to be responsible for both the treatments of the um, terrorist suspects, al Nashiri, um, in Poland and for the rendition. And here there was no hint that the Poles had um, taken part in the torturing by the, by the CIA. It was also unclear whether the Poles had sufficient knowledge of what would uh, happen to um, al-Nashiri after his departure for, um, from, um, from Polish soil. So in that sense, it was, it was responsibility for treatment by the United States and not for its own acts. But here the court reasons uh, in a way that comes close to well, the type of responsibility established by Article 16 of the ILC articles, it was responsible, responsible on account of its acquiescence and connivance, its acquiescence and um, connivance. Another case where the court accepted responsibility on the basis of control over an, uh, the, um, um, the acts of um, another state is the case of um, Ilasco, and that case concerned ill treatments of, um, well, again, some um, terrorism uh, suspects by the authorities of Transnistria. And Transnistria is officially part of uh, Moldova, but since the independence of Moldova in 1991, um, it has a sort of autonomous uh, status. So they do not accept the um, the, so the authorities there do not accept uh, Moldovan um, uh, sovereignty, and they can do so because some um, Russian army is stated there. Now, this region is not part of Russia, so in that sense it's not um, Russian um, territory, but uh, the court found that the Russians had quite decisive influence on what happened in Transnistria. And that influence was on the base of, I don't know, uh, gas supplies and um, they lent money and well, there were all kinds of, uh, of uh, agreements. So here again, although there was in no way it was, it was proven that the um, that Russian state officials had a hand in ill-treating um, in Lasku, still the court accepted that Russia was responsible because of its decisive influence over um, the Transnistrian um, uh, authorities, and it was sufficient that Russia had done nothing to prevent or put an end to the violations to, um, to assume a, um, a, um, a breach. So maybe, maybe that's indeed a way in which um, um, the responsibility by Italy for what um, happens in this case, in the SS first, first Italy case, uh, can be um, construed. Um, I think that the case is politically maybe, well, it's just, uh, obviously a politically very sensitive case. I mean, if the, if, if, if the court would rule that indeed, um, um, Italy, um, it, um, it, it's, it's, um, it, 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 it falls within um, Italian uh, jurisdiction that um, blows up this whole memorandum of, of um, understanding with, 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 with Libya and, uh, and the practice there. But in other sense, it is less explosive, I think, than a positive ruling in MN would have been. I mean, if the court had accepted um, extraterritorial jurisdiction in MN, then they would have created a legal pathway for refugees from all over the world to, to, to Europe. And here, well, the consequence would be that, Italian should, that Italy should continue uh, doing what it already had done from 2012 after Hiroshima 
until uh, 2018, namely um, patrolling the southern Mediterranean uh, for themselves and not through the proxy of, um, of uh, Libya. We'll see. Okay, then a, a final um, remark. Um, now, how to assess this, 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 this development? So, an appraisal of the developments as regards uh, the scope of application, rationale loci of the prohibition of refoulement. Um, I think how one appraises that depends on the time span one takes into consideration. As we have seen back in 51, 50 years ago, um, applicability of the prohibition at the border was not yet um, uh, accepted, at least not by um, all states, and applicability also in case of mass influxes was accepted decades later, and that is certainly progress, I think. Furthermore, I think the acceptance of um, um, extraterritorial jurisdiction over acts on the high seas is also progress. So in that sense, um, the appraisal is positive. At the same time, what is clear is that the um, acceptance of human rights responsibility uh, by at least the European Court of Human Rights, maybe more broadly by um, international organs, has not followed the developments in the externalization control by uh, states. So indeed, Italy was um, 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 found to be responsible in Hiroshima um, and accepted that. But then its response was to outsource patrolling of the of the south of the Mediterranean to um, to Libya. In that sense, um, well, not much progress has to be made. As to the immediate future, um, I don't know. As I said, I think that um, the case of MN is quite restrictive as regards the extraterritorial exercise of. Um, jurisdiction and I think that in other cases it will not be readily um, accepted. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for uh, uh, Professor Batius for this very inspiring presentation with uh, um, a number of questions that pop up, um, also a number of inputs where we could um, continue to work on, to research on, and also to work on the ground um, with um, many arguments that we have learned from your presentation. So, thank you very much. Um, I was uh, monitoring the chat and would like to take up a couple of questions that have been um, typed into the chat. The first one relates to exactly what you had just been saying at the end, this case of MN versus Belgium. Um, the question was there whether it, if it was not, uh, since it is not possible to, to really make a de facto control by asking for a humanitarian visa at a foreign embassy, um, could it not be possible to um, create a physical control um, or de facto control with by going through the carrier sanctions. So do carrier sanctions or also um, the, the checks before boarding an airplane that are imposed by the um, country of destination of where the airplane is going to, could those create some kind of control over the applicant that, that then would bring um, the case into the jurisdiction of, in MN, it was um, the European Court of Human Rights. Maybe. I, I hope it will be tried, but then um, carrier sanctions. Um, here again, the, the link between the act of state and actual persecution is, 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 is quite long. Um, and at least under the Convention of Human Rights, you have to start thinking of the of the the, the issue of jurisdiction. Now, the the act, so the the refusal to let one on the plane, is not done by a state agent. It is done by some employee of of the of the KLM or some or some some other firm. 
So you have to, you have to, to um, the act of state then would be the imposition of a of a um, of the of the um, uh, a carrier sanction. And there, um, I don't know how to um, construe that. I must say. Mm -hmm. So here, this is another another form of, of of outsourcing where where states are able to to hide to to hide behind the well by the fact that they've in fact outsourced the control to um, to um, to a private firm, which makes uh, litigation far more um, uh, difficult. Mm -hmm. So, um, if I may um, follow up on that, isn't this the challenge with all these um, pullbacks that we have and all the different forms of the pullbacks that we are witnessing today? Um, you had the case of, of this responsibility in the Libyan case in SS versus Italy, um, but uh, I I believe that this is the challenge that we are facing today. Somehow, get hold of those states that have these externalization policies, and um, to 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 really um, create some kind of responsibility or um, yeah that or that they can we can get hold of those states. I can only agree, yeah. But therefore, I think that that SS um, maybe maybe a promising case, and the reason is that it is um, the situation in itself is so is so close to 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 Hirsi Yama, and therefore it would be maybe less of a step to um, to um, to assume this 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 indirect responsibility um, um, uh, for, for, uh, for, for for the court. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move to another question that was um, posted by Nicolò Borgesano. Um, I, I'm reading the message because it's so succinct that I cannot really uh, paraphrase it without losing elements. So um, he writes that he has uh, written his academic dissertation on the Australian migration law framework and the turning back policy. And uh, then he continues that the Australian Human Rights Commission has offered an interesting interpretation on the existence of international obligations, trying to break the lack of specific definition. In the examinations of the migration package of legislation in 2013, the U Australian Human Rights Commission has established a threefold test that may suggest Australia's responsibility in the turning back policy. And then he elaborates on this threefold test. Firstly, they tend to answer whether effective control subsists or not. In the absence of effective control, they have stated that Australia's responsibility may nevertheless exist if authorities' actions constituted a link in the causal chain that would make possible violations in another jurisdiction. And finally, they have also started that stated that responsibility would also rise in case of treaty interpretation and implementation in bad faith. And then the question to you, Professor Batius, do you find this interpretation handy and well applicable in general? I'm not sure whether I, I understand um, uh, completely, but the, um, the first part that there is a um, there is responsibility um, in case a state act if um, is, is 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 a um, is is a link in a causal uh, in, in this is, is, is causal change that, that leads to to a breach. That is very close to the thinking, I think, of the um, Human Rights Committee. So. Um, in one case, the case of 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 of, of Munaf, the territorial uh, case, they have they have um, um, a reason so. But then, how to relay that to the Australian um, policy? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, so and, and, uh, and the second part was on on, on bad faith, but I, I didn't hear that very well. Could you? 
Uh, okay, yeah, so this threefold test, the first is the effective control, whether there is effective control or not, then in the absence of effective control, um, there is the second prong that is being tested, where the uh, responsibility arises um, because of the authority's action constitutes this link um, in the causal chain, what you just have dealt with. And the third element is um, that the Australian Human Rights Commission also um, would accept responsibility in case of um, bad faith um, treat interpretation and implementation. So bad faith in the interpretation and the implementation of, of treaties. But this would give rise to responsibility. Um, I understand better now. Um... Yes, to me it makes sense. Only you need a uh, you need a um, a um, a course to uh, to uh, say so. I myself think that the Court of Human Rights would not be inclined to accept this link in the cost chain kind of um, approach. Um, and as to bad faith um, responsibility on on bad faith. Um, I, I I don't see who that would work out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it might be a maybe a far guess. Um, if I may introduce one question, since we have had um, a number of of people who work in the field um, at the borders, um, maybe a very general questions. What would you tell to the people in the field at the borders? Um, faced with um, policies of rejection at the border um, or claims of extraterritorial violations uh, of the uh, full moon uh, principle, how should these cases be argued? Um, we could also say that maybe we could gather here and try to, to um, agree on how should should such cases be argued in order to bring them to international human rights bodies where maybe we can um, achieve something over time? Um, I'm afraid I do not really have an answer here. I mean, when it comes to rejection at the border, the law is quite clear. It's a violation of union law. And it is also pretty clear that's a violation of um, well, every um, prohibition of 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 of, of refoulement. Uh, but I'm not a specialist in 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 in, in tactical litig uh, litigation. Um, I myself, um, as, as 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 you mentioned in your in your introduction, um, cooperated in, in set up this, this 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 migration law clinic, uh, and we did so on the base of the idea that. Um, well, lawyers have less and less funding, less and less time for asylum case, at least in the in the in the, in the Netherlands. So we want to wanted to um, well, basically um, um, do something there and um, um, elaborate on really um, difficult cases. I hope that will, um, and, and I know there are a lot of that kind of um, of, of law clinics in in uh, in uh, in uh, Europe. Where to argue? Well. Court of Human Rights is, 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 is one thing. What I am very disappointed about in Europe is that there's not a whole bunch of infringement cases against those states that reject at the border um, by the European um, uh, Commission. It should have happened already a long time ago. So maybe maybe the best way to, to go with is to um, try and sort of influence the, the European uh, Commission in starting infringement uh, proceedings at the end. It should not, in an ideal world, this kind of thing should not end up for some human rights committee or some European Court of Human Rights. I mean, it's just plain European Union law that should be, um, and infringement should be addressed by European Union orders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the ideal world, um, unfortunately. In, in a normal world, I would say. Okay, in the normal world, yeah, that's that sounds more achievable. Um, uh, there is a further question. 
um, from Anja Klug, whether you could elaborate on the rationale of the European Court of Human Rights um, in their cautious approach to extraterritorial jurisdiction. Now you ask me to to look into the minds of the of the judges there. Um, I must say, um, where it comes to um, well to M to M N. Um, in a way, I can imagine that you um, that you come to this conclusion in the sense that um, um, if if you work with kind of political question doctrine as a judge in 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 the back of your of your head, so uh, opening up a legal pathway to um, to Europe is a political sensitive um, issue. It's a thing that means a lot for European society. So you could think that that would be something well more for uh, parliaments than for courts to, uh, to to decide about. It's not my kind of thing uh, of thinking. I'm a lawyer. I was very surprised to find all these new distinctions in MN. I mean, where I previously always read only um, states exert uh, exercise. Extraterritorial jurisdiction through the acts of their of their uh, diplomatic personnel. Now it turned out it was only towards your nationals and their property, and not to to foreigners. Then then some additional requirement come, comes in. I think that's funny from a legal um, um, point of view. But the um, um, maybe maybe there, there there is this this this. Conviction that it's a political issue rather than a, um, a a legal issue, and I must say this: the court, in its present constellation, is in general not so migrants migrant minded as previous courts uh, were. I think. I mean, the case of ND and NT versus uh, Spain concerning the entry into those um, 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 Spanish enclaves in uh, in uh, Morocco. Also, the, the case of um, of um, Ilias versus um, uh, Hungary, where they were quite lenient, I think, about the detention practices by the by the uh, Hungarians. This is not a very activist um, court. By the way, it, it has been remarked by um, many commentators, and maybe they were right that, um, well, at least in the context of. Um, the case of X and X, if the Court of Justice would have ruled in favor of the migrants, um, then the first thing member states would have done would have been to amend the Schengen visa code in order to delete this, this humanitarian uh, visa um, uh, provision. And maybe the same would have been true if the court would have given a more positive ruling in, in, um, in MN. Um, the, there is another question on, in respect of MN that has come up in the chat, and I just want to, to bring that to the discussion. Um, how would you, or what would you guess that if um, in, a, in a specific case would meet some of the criteria that you um, have elaborated in your presentation? Um, could that trigger extraterritorial jurisdiction? So, for example, a proof of a previous link. Um, and, and there is also reference made to the embassy procedure that was created by Hungary to pre-screen asylum seeker. So it, would that change or could that change the, the assessment and by the European Court of Human Rights? If you could prove, uh, uh, if you could prove a previous link, well, yes, that's that's what that's what they say. But what it means, um, I don't know, and nobody has an idea. I think this is something that suddenly came up in this in this um, um, uh, case, um, and I doubt whether it um, would be sufficient to be, I don't know, to have had, for example, previous legal residence in Belgium. To then um, um, to to 
I, I doubt whether that will be uh, sufficient for uh, there have been cases um, on that. I think it's the the Wahab uh, case by, by by the courts where um, um, a person um, well started litigation um, against I think it was the it was the UK on on the basis of um, previous um, uh, legal uh, presence and there the court said no that is not enough to establish this extraterritorial jurisdiction um, uh, link. So I wouldn't know. The only thing I can think of in the context of, of MN is where states themselves run some sort of, um, um, well, FISA scheme or, or some, some possibility to, to opt for, um, for uh, resettlements. Mm -hmm. Then there is initiative from the part of the of, of, of the state and may, maybe then maybe then that could be a basis for this for this uh, for this uh, link and and um so in, in apparently hungary sends um applic uh, asylum applicants um from hungary to the hungarian embassy in serbia and directs the procedure like from from uh, far away. So does this change the situation? Would that create the link? Yes, if they if they set something up them, themselves, um, maybe, yeah. Um, in in, in and, and, um well, I would have to look at the text, but they, um, they remark um, 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 something on that, on the, um, the, the, the situation would, 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 would be different in that kind of, of, uh, of uh, FISA scheme. They had to do that because in and NT, the court stated that there was no, no problem with these um, migrants not being allowed into those Spanish enclaves because they could always turn to um, Spain's embassy for a, uh, for a legal uh, pathway. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe one more general question also um, in respect of what the future could bring. And, and you already um, exposed some, I, I would call it deception with um, the, what the European Court of Human Rights is doing. So what do you think, um, what line of reasoning will the European Court of Human Rights um, adopt in the future? Will it remain on the rather defensive side? And might maybe another human rights body like, and I'm really thinking of the uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child, will they be more dynamic? And will that be maybe a more um, promising court of, uh, ac uh, court of action to, to follow the, the Committee on the Right of the Child. I think it's definitely worth uh, worth um, um, a trial. I think that's um, the um, not only that committee, but also the Human Rights Committee and um, um, the Committee Against um, uh, Torture are far more open in their in their approach to um, extraterritorial um, uh, jurisdiction. Only there have been so so few um, um, uh, cases there. So yes, that would certainly be worth a um, a, um, a, a a try. And besides, um, even after X and X, I would not give up hope to um, for um, European Union um, uh, organs. So the Court of Justice, um, well, this case of X and X, which was also on on the FISA um, uh, application. They said um, basically that uh, this was not a matter for the court, but for uh, member states um, to decide when when applying this this this, this provision, um, right? Uh, but in general, um, its reasoning is, is is far more straightforward than um, European Court of, um, of 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 Human Rights. It's when it comes to um, migrant rights, um, well. It far better simply sticks to the to the legislation um, it knows, which with um, as a result that, for example, the um, the case law on um, detention 
both pre-entry detention and, and return um, detention of the um, Court of Justice has meant far more, I think, than the case law of the European Court of, um, of uh, Human Rights. Um, yeah, you, you're opening a completely new field where we could then now continue to, to discuss for um, another two hours on, on detention in this context of refoulement, the uh, prohibition of refoulement. Uh, I would maybe like to, to give you a question also to sum up. There are no more questions coming up in the chat. So, it, it, Let's assume that um, you have to explain to someone who is really opposed to extraterritorial application of the non refoulement principle, who argues that all the cases that you brought were um, decided by human rights bodies, the European Court of Human Rights, the uh, um, uh, Human Rights Committee, and so on, that um, if we look at the historical evidence, the materials, um, there is no, nothing was really, no one really thought about extraterritorial application of the non refoulement principle, um, and that there is not really a state practice that would tell us that extraterritorial application um, of the non refoulement principle has attained customary law status. How would you try? to persuade this critical person that, yes, there is extraterritorial application of the no reformal principle. I would say that there does not exist such a thing as a legal void unless we create it. So, the basic rule in, in law is that power comes with responsibilities and state power comes with the obligation to respect um, human rights. Now, I think it is simply not fair play where states go off the soccer field and start playing there and then say, hey, the normal rules of soccer do not apply. Why would it be so? When you move the game to another place, the rules should move um, uh, with you. That would basically be my uh, my answer. I uh, I think. Thank you very much. Um, I, it would show that that soccer can be used in all contexts. It's a worldwide played game. It can be used in all the contexts, all the legal contexts, even in our context of extraterritorial application of um, um, of the non reformal principle, uh, we will remember that if we change the playing field, we take the rules with us. It was a pleasure for me, um, Professor Batias, to have you as a guest lecturer here in digital campus Lucerne, not really in Lucerne. I hope really for next time that we can personally meet uh, they were inspiring two hours. Thank you very much. And I give to Anya, I guess, for the final word. Thank you very much. I've extremely enjoyed this lecture and I extremely enjoyed, I have to say, especially this dialogue between you uh, experts. And I have noted down, Professor Howard, is what you said, your final statement. I think we should have <laughs> concluded the session with this. I will certainly make use of this in my own intervention. Thank you so much. And thank you also for, to our audience for having been with us for these two hours in an extremely complicated legal questions. I didn't expect that this would raise so much attention. So I hope that everybody who has been listening will also use this argumentation and the knowledge that you have shared with us in the interventions. Thank you very much and have a nice evening to everybody.